Ryan, on Monday, the 18th of May, a NASDAQ listed company called Moderna made an exciting announcement about a vaccine for the coronavirus. Uh, in response to that, the Dow Jones jump, jumped 900 points on the day uh, and the stock shot up too. In fact, from the 21st of February low uh, for that stock to the May the 18th high, Moderna's share price is up a massive 340%. The interesting thing about this story is the pace uh, at which it is potentially going to find a vaccine for the coronavirus, and it's achieved in months what normally takes a couple of years. Can you give us some insight into what's going on there? What's the story? Yeah, so obviously uh, Moderna uh, made huge headlines on the announcement that they were fairly close to potentially finding a vaccine for, for COVID-19. And it didn't just result in a huge spike in um, the Moderna share price, but it also had a huge uh, uh, effect on the world stock markets. And Moderna wasn't uh, the only biotech that's been making big moves in recent uh, weeks and months. Uh, there's a company in the UK called Gene Drive, which is up a, a stunning 3,400% in just six weeks. There was a company in Australia called Genetic Signature, which is up over 100% in, in less than a month. Um, and obviously, some of these moves are based on short-term hype around finding a vaccine. And in the short term, you're going to um, see some volatility and, and, and huge rises and probably some steep falls in the share prices of, of these biotech companies. However, if you take a closer look at the sector that these companies are actually in, the sector of biotech they're actually in, you actually see there's a deeper story playing out. And it's a story which I think represents a paradigm shift in the entire biotech industry. And it's a reason why Moderna might actually be very close to finding a vaccine in record breaking time. And anyone who's looked at biotech before knows that usually vaccines can take years to develop. And yet we could actually have a feasible vaccine in production by the end of the year or early 2021, which is, is amazing. And the reason for that is this emerging field of biotech, which is, like I said, it's a paradigm shift in how we look at biotech called synthetic biology or SynBio in short. And why that's so significant is it actually brings biotech research from the 20th century process of, you know, people in white lab coats, looking at petri dishes, doing long experiments, which take years. It brings that into the 21st century and adds the power of computing to this process. And it does that by fundamentally changing the way we look at the problems in biotech. So when you're trying to solve a, a disease, what synthetic biology does is, instead of looking at that as a biological problem, it looks at it almost as a coding problem. It looks at the molecular level of DNA to work out how they can code a solution. So in the way of thinking of synthetic biology, drugs and, and treat medical treatments are more like programs interacting with, with a computer. So it becomes a coding issue. And you're talking about coding DNA, encoding proteins in a specific way to interact like how a program interacts with a computer. And the word synthetic obviously means that these are man-made creating compounds. The old way of doing biology, um, you tried to find natural compounds that had a specific effect on the body, or, you know, whereas synthetic biology turns that problem on its head. It looks at um, the, the DNA of the structure it's trying to solve, looks for issues in that code, and then it tries to create a, a, a program which will solve that, that, that issue. And this is, like I said, I've said this is a paradigm shift a few times, but it is, it's, it's akin to, to give you a brief analogy, it's like how um, when Einstein came along, he completely changed the way we saw the physical world. You know, before that we had Isaac Newton that said, this is the way the world works. And everyone said, yeah, that's, that's fine. Then Einstein came along and said, well, here's the theory of relativity. <laughs> and actually this is how the world works. And this is what I think is happening with biotech with this emerging field of synthetic biology. It's changing the way we perceive biotech and biotech research, and the implications are gonna be immense. And we're starting to see the early fruits of that in, in Moderna's announcement, for example, on how fast they might be able to find a vaccine. And that's because they're tapping into the computing power that we've got in the 21st century, rather than relying on the old methods, which are 
you know, actually born in the Spanish flu of 1918. These are the old ways. We're moving to a new way of doing biological research. And it's very early days. I mean, I think it's a, it's like a, when, when the computer revolution took off, IBM had computers with the size of small houses. We're probably at that stage of synthetic biology. But as we know, over the next 50 years, that's resulted into the amazing computer-driven world that we live in today. That's what's going to happen with biotech and biological research over the next few decades. And, that, and synthetic biology is at the forefront of that, that trend. Ryan, you mentioned recently that Moderna had had a big move thanks to its uh, vaccine work on the coronavirus. And, and you also talked about a couple of other stocks that had done very well. Uh, my question is, and I'm sure the question a lot of people um, have, is it's all well and good to talk about these stocks and get excited about them after they've already had some big gains. Uh, but how do you go about finding these opportunities before the moves actually happen? Yeah, that's a great question, Greg. And, that, and that's the, the key point, isn't it? I mean, I'm the editor of a service called Exponential Stock Investor. And the first stage of trying to discover a stock with exponential potential um, starts with looking for something I call a collision point. And a collision point is an event in time that happens, which fundamentally changes the path of the future. Now, a lot of that time, that can be a technological innovation. Um, so, for example, um, the invention of the motor car in the early 1900s had uh, knock-on effects beyond just the invention of a car. It, it created the urbanization of America and everything that, that came along with that. Um, the microchip, microchip in the 60s is a classic one that led to the computing revolution we're in today. Uh, in recent years, the internet is probably the big one. Uh, when that came along, it ch fundamentally changed how we now do business a, a lot of the time and changed the world as we know it. Not all collision points are technologically driven, though. Um, some, for example, are geopolitical. Well, the, the big world wars, World War One and World War Two, had you know everlasting effects which changed the path of the future. The fall of the Berlin Wall in the 80s is another huge moment. Um, the U.S. coming off the the gold standard in 1971 that's had ramifications that uh, in terms of how we look at currencies and, and things like that, which are still playing out today. Um, and another collision point is, of course, when there is some big emergency, like the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the best analogy we have that in history is the, the Spanish flu almost 100 years ago or, or over 100 years ago in 1918. And actually, that collision point created huge changes that came through society, especially in the field of, of biotech and biological research. Um, the Spanish flu spurred... Um, research into finding vaccines, specifically flu vaccines, which underpins the entire process by which we still do biological research today. The, it took them 20 years to find a vaccine, mind you, and it's a slow process. But the, the way that biology and biological research started then is fundamentally still the way we do it today. However, in recent years, that's been changing. Um, the way we do biological research is very slow, it's very expensive, and now that COVID-19 has, has uh, just hit the world, it's not, it's not acceptable anymore. That's, that's a collision point which has underpinned that we need better ways to do biotech research. Now, that process was already coming with an emerging field of biology I call, um, called synthetic biology. That was already a trend in the making. And it's a, it's a brand new way of doing biology. It's a paradigm shift in how we think of, of doing biology, which um, utilizes the power of computers and computing power to really uh, turbocharge the, the research and drug discovery process. And that process was underway. It was at a very early stage, but it was happening. But now that COVID 19's hit, I think the world has just sat up and realized we need to do biotech better. And it's going to in my opinion, result in huge inflows of money into this unique field called synthetic biology, which is going to help us create the solutions to ensure that this type of pandemic never hits the world again. Because the economic, aside from the health implications, of course, the economic implications are immense and are not really acceptable for the, the kind of world we want to live in. Um, so COVID-19 was a collision point. And of course, there's going to be short-term spikes in companies that are looking for vaccines and things like that. Those spikes will come and go, and that will happen with a variety of different stocks. How you can, you can make money long-term as an investor is to try and think about 
what is going to change in the world we live in after this moment. And in the field of biotech research, in my opinion, that means this synthetic biology trend is going to be one of the biggest exponential trends we see over the next decade. Um, it's still at a very early stage, but I think now the world realizes the importance of having more efficient, speedy biotech research systems. Ryan, most investors, nearly everyone has heard of biotechs, even if they haven't invested directly in the sector. Uh, biotechs in Australia as well, it's been around for a long time, but it does have a reputation for being a bit of a money sink. Um, can you explain why the emerging synthetic biology sector that you've been talking about is different from, from standard biotechs in this respect? And what's the potential growth pro profile of the sector going forward? Yeah, so as anyone who's ever invested in a biotech company before, uh, it can be a painfully slow process. Um, traditionally, most biotech uh, research companies go through three phases of drug development. Um, that goes from phase one through to phase two and uh, phase three. So phase one is trying to work out what drugs might work. Phase two is more testing. Phase three generally leads to some sort of clinical trials. Um, but that process can take years, even sometimes a decade or more. And as, of course, the, the, the potential rewards for any successful biotech company are huge. They're astronomical. But a lot of investors underestimate the time that it can take. And in the meantime, while all this research is, is happening, the company needs money, they need to raise capital, and they need to pay their research fees, their researchers, get tests done, and all this, all these other things that they need to do to hopefully, and there's absolutely no guarantee they'll make it, land on a successful drug. So it's inherently risky, it's long, it's expensive. Um, and actually, it's unusual in, in terms of how we think about uh, technology and progress, a lot of us think of, oh, as time has gone on, we get fast, things get faster and cheaper and we get better at it. But with um, bio, bio, biology and biotech, it's actually the opposite that's happening. I just want to briefly show you a, a, a quick chart which will explain what I'm, I'm talking about. Let me just share this with you. Um, can you see this chart? So, so like this it. chart here shows something called Arum's law, and it compares it with something called Moore's law. Now, a lot of people uh, would probably have heard of Moore's law before, and that was the the rule uh, or, or the sort of theory that was developed in the late 60s that said the computing power, uh, the processing power of a computer would double roughly every two years. And that's pretty much happened since the early 70s. And um, it was founded by Intel founder Gordon Moore, and it's resulted in the huge innovation in computing power that we've seen over the last five decades. It's you know responsible for your, your iPhone and your iPad and, and immense uh, progress in making computing power cheap. So this graph's a little bit inverted. The red line shows the, the Moore's law, and what it shows is the computing power you get per $1,000. And the scale on the left-hand side is actually an exponential scale. So although that looks like a linear curve, that's actually an exponential hockey stick-shaped graph saying that for every $1,000 we've spent, we are getting a vast amount more uh, computing power from 1950 through to, to the present day. Now, the green line is something called Arum's Law. And you might have worked out quickly that Arum's Law, if you, if you spell Arum backwards, it's Moore's Law backwards. <laughs> and the the biotech researchers who came up with this law obviously realized the the sort of um, the difference between this and Moore's law because what the green line shows is it shows on the right hand side scale the drugs per billion dollars spent and so you can see that for every billion dollars spent over time we're getting less and less drugs which essentially is saying that it's getting more expensive to create new drugs as time's gone on which to a lot of people might not make sense, um, especially in the, the, the world we live in where we're used to technology getting faster and cheaper. With biotech research, the opposite has been ha happening, which is crazy if you think about it, but it's, it's basically due to the fact that we still use the same brute force biological research techniques as we have since for the last 100 years. It's still people in white coats in labs using petri dishes to do slow biological experiments, which take a lot of time. And as our needs have become more complex, that has added to the expense as well. 
There's also the fact that the regulatory approvals process has got more complex with the complexity of the medicines as well. So all that has meant is, is that biotech research has never been more uh, slower or more expensive, which is, is crazy. Now, this is where the emerging field of synthetic biology comes in. Synthetic biology, uh, which is still a very early stage of development, it's trying to flip this Arum's law on its head and make it more like Moore's law. And how it does that is that it is fundamentally changing the way we look at the, the biotech problem. It looks at the biotech problem as a computing problem. So when you look at the, the base level of, 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 a, of an organism, organism, you're looking at the DNA structure, you know, the four uh, acids that make up uh, a, a genome and the order of those acids actually controls how that, that organism works. And what synthetic biology is doing is it's looking at that DNA structure as a, as a source code, as you, if you will, as a coding problem. And then when they create drugs, they're trying to create uh, compounds. They're trying to code program, uh, compounds to act more like programs interacting with that source code. So this is a complete different way of thinking about um, biotech research. It's making biotech more like computing science in a way and because of that because it comes a, a coding problem it means you can bring in the power of computers uh, artificial intelligence machine learning big data you could use all that information to fast track that phase one process of even trying to think about what proteins would work to solve a disease like cancer or like COVID-19 or whatever the disease is how it works with synthetic synthetic biology is they try and isolate the, the DNA sequence of the problem and look at that source code and then use the power of machine learning and, and big data and computing to run millions and millions of simulations to try and work out what sequence of what program, what compound, which can be like a, a computer program, will work on that best. So this brings forward, this, this doesn't only make it cheaper, it actually brings forward that biotech research process by years. What feasibly took years and you know or even decades in the past might only take weeks and months in the future i'll give you an example of how the future might look if there was another pandemic like covid 19 in the future the whole process of combating this might be to isolate the dna sequence within a few weeks go through a synthetic biology company's lab where they they will develop a, a program essentially to deal with that and create a vaccine and that might take weeks the code for that vaccine might be emailed out throughout the world to specially created uh, labs called biofoundries, which can recreate vaccines using uh, base layer molecular um, compounds. So you, you don't need to find some naturally occurring uh, compound that's hard to get. You, you recreate it from scratch, so at the molecular level, and that could be out into the community within a month or two from when it's discovered. Now, that, that, that is the way the future is going. We're not there yet, of course. We're still at a very early stage. But that could be the future of how diseases are treated, that process, which is significantly different from how it's been done in the past. Now, going back to, going back to an earlier conversation we had on Moderna, that obviously explains why uh, Moderna's share price has done so well, given that they are in, in this field. You mentioned earlier that this is still, you know, a very early stages. What, what sort of market size are we looking for syn synthetic biology at the moment? And, and where do you think this could go to in the future? Yeah, and, and as an investor, so, so aside from the humanitarian benefits, as an investor looking for an exponential opportunity, this is probably the most exciting um, opportunity we'll see this decade. To give you some example of the scale of the opportunity, Right now, synthetic biology makes up a very small part of the whole biotech industry. It's a $5 billion per year industry as it stands, or a touch over $5 billion. Some industry insiders think that this will be a $20 trillion market within the next decade. So from $5 billion to $20 trillion. And that's because synthetic biology, it, has, it changes the way we do biotech, and that's one thing, but it also has a whole bunch of spin-offs as well. It does, it's not just... It's just not, not, not just medicine, even though that's the thing we're focusing on today. It's not just biotech and medicine and disease treatment. Uh, the fake meat, meat fad of last year, uh, that was derived from synthetic biology, the learnings of synthetic biology. There's talk of synthetic biology techniques being used to create new fuels, new types of fuel. So we might not need solar or wind or oil or coal. It might be fuel created in a lab at, at the molecular level. Uh, 
materials like clothes even might be synthetically produced to have certain effects. Um, so the, the whole uh, gamut of what synthetic biology is going to touch is, is akin to how the internet touched a lot of different industries. You know, it didn't just change retail, it changed banking, it changed work life. And the industry inside us that, that think this is, could be a 20 trillion a year industry think that synthetic biology will be one of those underpinning technologies like the internet, like the microchip, uh, a long time into the future. On, on, a, on a deeper level, though, I suppose it's it's exciting, but you know maybe a little bit worrying because you're talking about humans having the ability to almost play God and deal with the very structures of life. And, you know, part of you thinks, really, is that, is that, is that a great idea? But with most uh, human progress, we're going to go for it no matter what. So I think as a story, it's something people should be following just for the, the interest and the excitement. And as an investing opportunity, it's probably, you know, my favorite sector to look for investing opportunities, for exponential opportunities for the next decade at least. Ryan, Australia has always had a pretty solid biotech scene. Uh, it just doesn't attract the type of risk capital that you see in the US markets. Uh, so can you give um, listeners a bit of an idea about how Australia is placed to take advantage of this new um, synthetic biotechnology? Uh, or do investors have to go offshore to, to look for these opportunities? And, and what stocks are you looking at in the sector? Yeah, as you said, Greg, Australia is fortunate to have actually quite a thriving biotech scene. And in my opinion, it's it's a little bit of a bugbear that we don't focus more on that in the you know the political world and, and, and trying to um, you know promote Australia's biotech scene as an industry leader because we do have the human capital, we have the the universities and the intellect to really you know become a sort of Silicon Valley of biotech in my opinion. However, when it comes specifically to synthetic biology, we're still at a very, very early stage, and right now. There's not that many stocks in Australia or even overseas. In the US, a lot of the leading names are actually still private companies. It's, it's venture capital money going into them. And a lot of the big names of venture capital are entering this space in a big way. Um, Ginkgo Bioworks is, is, a, is a company you could probably look into. They're not a listed company. They're a, they're a private company, but they give a lot of good information on how big the synthetic biology field could, could be. However, in saying all that, I have actually managed to uh, find a handful of stocks, really good stocks that have been in that synthetic biology space for, for, for a while, it was from the embryonic stages of it. I can't reveal their names in a public forum right now because they are part of my exponential stock investing uh, service, which you know, I need to be con conscious of the fact that there's paying subscribers that get that information. Uh, but there are some companies you can invest in. At a broader level, in Australia, we actually are very fortunate to have a number of companies in the more general field of, of medtech or of medical technology who are utilizing the power of um, big data to really make the healthcare system, which is pretty slow and cumbersome, turn it into a really efficient, cost-effective beast. And we actually have several companies that have toeholds in big world markets that are still very small companies. You know, you're talking under $200 million market cap. And yet they are riding this new wave of interested in med tech because the fact is the world sort of realizes now that an investment in uh, medical technology and synthetic biology actually is going to pay dividends into the future. You know, it's not, a, it's not something that's going to cost money. It's something that's going to create value for the companies and countries that can get it right. And Australia is fortunate to have several stocks, which, our live recommendations in exponential stock investor that are riding that wave and have huge potential. So there are opportunities out there. Synthetic biology, very, very hard to come by right now, but I think that will change in Australia in the future. Generally in med tech, again, there are opportunities, but you have to be selective and look for, for good teams that are, are getting a toehold in the most important markets. And yeah, again, it becomes down to careful stock selection. So, so ride the wave, ride the trend. It's a, the synthetic biology and medical technology. They're two huge trends, which I think most or all investors should at least look into. Um, but at the end of the day, stock selection will win out. So be careful with that. Right. Thanks very much for that, Ryan. Uh, very interesting discussion. And if you are interested in some of the things that Ryan's been talking about or some of the stocks on his exponential stock investor buy list, please click on the link below.